Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you this afternoon for your blessed presence in our midst. Because we have gathered in the name of your dear Son and our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you Lord for your word that is before us and your spirit who is there to guide us. And your presence which is there to refresh us. And the fellowship of your people in whose company we can better understand the length and the breadth and the height and the depth of your love. We pray, O oh God, that the meditation of our hearts and the words of my mouth this noon time be found acceptable and pleasing in your sight. For we ask this prayer in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Now today I have a very difficult subject to preach to you. In the course of this message, some of you might feel offended even though I don't want to offend you. I don't mean to be critical, but when you want to be analytical with the preaching and teaching of God's Word, we must be ready to unlearn certain things in order that we may learn that which is really right. Unlearning is always difficult, more difficult than learning, but it is necessary. So this day I have a very important subject with me. I don't want to keep you in suspense for too long. I want to speak to you today on the other side of worship. The other side of worship. We are living in the days of restoration. If you have your Bibles, please turn with me to the third chapter of Book of Acts. Acts third chapter, I will read to you from verse 19 to verse 21. Repent therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out, so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send Jesus Christ, who was preached to you before, <laughs> whom heaven must receive until the times of restoration of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. I'm not going to fully expound this passage because we won't have sufficient time if I get into the details of this passage. But I would like to just underline a few phrases. Times of restoration, we have in verse 21. And again in the same verse, the restoration of all things. And when you look at verse 19, times of refreshing. Times of refreshing and then times of restoration. Now, if you want to make it better understandable, you can call the times of refreshing as times of revival or renewal. And the ultimate purpose of times of refreshing is not to make us feel good or excited, but lead us to times of restoration. Any revival or any re renewal that fails to reach a point for restoration of all that has been lost, it has missed its very purpose. In church history, there have been many, many revivals. God has raised many men of His, and He has used them for revival. Times of visitation of God among His people. But those revivals, as fast and as suddenly they came, they died out. In several instances, the revivals came with the preacher and they went away with the preacher. Now this has been what we read in church history. But there were certain revivals which in the sovereign plan of God and purpose of God worked towards restoration of what the church has lost. Now that always yielded abiding results. Mark my words clearly this morning. So here, the plan that is presented before us is that times of refreshing will come from the presence of God so that there will be restoration of all things. And there is another truth I want to emphasize here, a restoration of all things. But what we normally do in times of revival or renewal is that we pick up only that which is appealing to us. 
I am making this as a building, brick by brick. You have to follow me carefully. We pick up only that which is appealing to us, or if I should be more practical, we choose only that which is convenient and leave out things which are more difficult. Take for example, the doctrine of tithing. People of God in the Old Testament, during a long period of time, were tithing very regularly and sincerely. But soon they backslided from this holy institutional habit. So God raised many prophets to sound an alarm in the ears of God's people to get back to these essential fundamentals. One such prophet was Prophet Malachi, the last, the author of the last book of the 39 books of the Old Testament. That is why Malachi said, you have robbed me. You have stolen away from what belongs to me. And you people ask, in what thing do you rob me, God? It is in tithes and offerings. So bring tithes and offerings and prove me whether I will not open the windows of heaven and pour my blessing on you so there will not be room enough to receive it. So it was not Malachi who first of all gave the teaching on tithing. It was already there. People abandoned it. People fell away from that holy habit. And Prophet Malachi came to remind God's people so this holy institutional habit will be restored to its place. And the people who got that very much appealing to them was the Pharisaical sect of the religious day of Jesus. Pharisees. So they be became very strict and close adherence of the letter of that law of tithing. So they began to tithe even of their grains, even of their spices. So see, spices is the one that we keep in very small bottles. You don't get sacks of spices. So even in the spices, they were tithing to God. But they left out the weightier matters of the law. So Jesus came heavily upon them Turn with me to Matthew's Gospel, 23rd chapter. I would not turn to all the references because I would assume that you have a basic knowledge of these uh, teaching passages of the Bible. 23, 23 of Matthew's Gospel. Woe to you scribes and Pharisees and hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint and allies and come in, but you have neglected the weightier matters of the law. Now what are the weightier matters of the law? Justice and mercy and faith. And Jesus corrected it saying, These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. You see, when one truth is restored, you pick up that which is convenient and leaving the other side. So Jesus said, This you must do all right, as Malachi said, but you should not leave the other side. Now, like this, there are so many truths, both in the Old Testament and New Testament, which were restored only partially. We are living in a days of restoration in church history, in church period. And one of the truths that is largely and very widely, not just in one region, but globally, is restored through the church of Jesus Christ, is the doctrine of worship. Everywhere, this worship, the word worship has become so popular. Praise and worship, praise and worship. Fifteen years ago, only in charismatic circles this was very popular. But today, even in non-charismatic, or let me add, even in anti-charismatic circles and churches, they do give a time for praise and worship, lest they lose their members. Somehow it is getting into a place where it should be. So praise and worship has become unusually popular in all of church history. Putting the 2000 years of church history together, I believe at no point of time the church experienced praise and worship as it is experiencing now. But what is normally understood 
by the people of God on the average by this word worship is singing and shouting, clapping and laying out of hand, laying of hand, lifting up of hands, and in some circles, jumping and hopping and dancing. Nothing more. I want to tell you this is worship, but this is hardly 10% of what worship is. Singing and shouting and repeating the last two stanzas twice or thrice with eyes closed, lifting up of the hands, swinging and dancing, jumping and hopping, whirling around. All these things do have a place. All these things do constitute worship, but that is hardly 10%. There is the other side. That is what I'm going to speak to you this afternoon. If you don't look at the other side, you will be like Ephraim. What do I mean by being like Ephraim? The Bible says in Hosea 7th chapter, 8th words, you don't need to turn it. You can note it down and read it later on. Ephraim is like a cake that is not turned. He is baked only on one side and he is not baked on the other side. There are so many of you Indians here so I can easily give that example. Ephraim is like a dough side who is baked or cooked only on one side. Now that is how most of the Christians are concerning this exercise of worship. Let us now turn to the other side of worship this morning. In order to explain to you the other side of worship, I want to pick up seven aspects to dwell on during the next 50 minutes before us. I will have to go rather fast and I would very much encourage you to note down the references here and there and do it as a homework when you get back home this afternoon and see for yourself whether things are so. If you have not brought your Bibles, please share the Bibles of your neighbors. What is the other side of worship? Number one, surrender of our bodies. Surrender of our bodies. Do you know, beloved, we cannot actually give anything to God? Let me say that again. Do you know, beloved, that we cannot actually and really give anything to God? Turn with me to the book of Romans, 11th chapter, reading from 33rd words. These are all key texts. I would call them pivotal texts. Romans 11th chapter, Paul was writing a doctrinal treatise. But even in the midst of that doctrinal epistle, he broke into rapturous worship. Even while writing a doctrinal epistle, he breaks into rapturous worship and he makes this statement. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how such a word are his judgment and his ways past finding out. Who has known the mind of the Lord has been his counselor? Or who has first given to him that it shall be repaid to him. We cannot actually give anything to God because everything that we have is what belongs to God. See, this is a very important truth that we need to understand. And he says in verse 36, For of him and through him and to him are all things. And he says, Amen. He has not completed his letter, but he puts an Amen there. That's not an Amen of completion, but that is an Amen of attestation. So he says, of him, through him, and to him are all things. You can't actually give anything to God. And then he says in the 12th chapter, first verse, he did not write as 11th chapter and 12th chapter. It was a continuous whole lot. And he says, I beseech you, therefore, brothers. 
Because you cannot actually give anything to God and everything you think that you are giving was already belonging to God himself. What you can now do as a reasonable thing, look at the 12th chapter first words, I beseech you therefore brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies, a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable or rational service. I hope you get the message. The first aspect of worship is that we give our bodies unto God. We surrender our bodies unto God. What an awesome truth that how serious is this matter. Praise and worship can sometimes become a substitute for the holiness of the body. That is why many people fail. They had a great victory in the city of Jericho, but when they came to a smaller city by name A, they were miserably defeated. And they found the problem was with one man whose name was Achan. You know which tribe that Achan belonged to? The tribe of Judah. Judah means praise. The word of God is full of wisdom. Judah means praise. It was from a tribe which was called praise came that man Achan. And he was the Reason number one for the utter failure and defeat of God's people in a much smaller city. And Joshua came to Achan. You know what Joshua said? Son, make a confession of your sins and give glory to God. You read that passage carefully, Joshua. See that? I, I underline that word clearly. You have brought defeat. I ignore me on the people of God. Now you make a confession of your sins and give glory to God. Praise can become an absolutely an empty exercise without surrendering of our bodies to God. That is why the Bible says, lift up your lift up your not hands. Lifting up your holy hands unto the Lord. I wish that men everywhere. Pray, lifting up of their holy hands. Why holy hands? Just underline that. So surrender of our bodies. That is the other side of worship. That is why Paul thundered from that hill of Mars. You know what he told them? God does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he worshipped with the hands of men as if he wants to receive anything from us. Nothing. See, all these people were consistently making the theological correction in the minds of people. Otherwise, in course of time, when we are very busy in worship and very liberal in giving, we may be thinking, we are doing God a favor by worshipping him. Not at all. That is why Jesus Christ, when he went into the temple, he so mercilessly whipped the people out because that was his temper. Now today the Holy Spirit wants to do the same thing. It is not our spirit, but it is our body, uh, which is the temple of the Holy Spirit. What body? This body of flesh and blood. Understand it very clearly. We need not a correction. Our bodies. This physical stature, 5 or 5.5 5 or 6 feet, this stature, this figure, this physical thing, that is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Surrender of our bodies is the first aspect of the other side of worship. Secondly, Unquestioning obedience. Unquestioning obedience is the second aspect of the other side of worship. Do you know where that word worship comes for the first time in the Holy Bible, in English Bible? 
You know out of whose lips that word first of all came out? A casual reader of the Bible would miss it. But if you closely study the Bible, it makes a very interesting observation. The person who first used that word worship in the English Bible as we have it now was Abraham. You know when he said it? Turn with me to Genesis 22nd chapter and look at the fifth words. Genesis 22 and 5. And Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. The lad, the young man and I will go yonder and worship and we will come back to you. Now I want to ask you a question very honestly. What did Abraham mean when he told the people that he was going to worship? I think it was a camouflage. What was he going for? <laughs> you know that, isn't it? He didn't expect any angel to intervene when he lifted his uh, sword, did he? No. Today, if we do it, we'll know because there is a precedent. <laughs> but at that time, in Abraham's time, he wanted to kill his son. But he tells his servants, we are going to worship and we'll come back. So by worship, Abraham meant sacrificing his only son in absolute, unquestioning, sincere, immediate, and implicit obedience to God. Amen. Amen. Now I'm just making you think. We are all now meditating the word together. Earlier he had already worshipped God. In the 21st chapter, if you look at verse 33, Abraham planted a tamarisk tree in Beersheba and there called on the name of the Lord, the everlasting God. That was a normal worship. We all will do it. But now in chapter 22 comes the other side of worship. He was ready to sacrifice his earthly son in honor of the commandment of the everlasting God. He didn't ask God any question. Why? Did he ever think about it? I did not send my son to matinee shows or to dance in parties with getting drunk. I was bringing up my son in all godliness. God himself had testified that I know Abraham, how he will teach his descendants the ways that I have given him. This testimony I have already received from the Lord even before I got my son. How come? Why should I sacrifice my son? Have I been over occupied with my son? Have I been preoccupied with my son in the sense I left worship? I forgotten God? Was I taken up with blessings to the extent I forgot the blessing? None of these things are anywhere recorded in the Holy Writ. So he could have asked, why does God want me to sacrifice my son? I'm sure he had had the question, but he immediately silenced that question with an answer that was constant in his heart. You know what that answer was? God is God. God is God. So he was able to implicitly obey God because of that theological knowledge that he had that God is God. He is Lord. Now that is worship. That is worship, isn't it? When somebody asks you to do something, you don't understand why that person asks you to do something and how that person can ever ask you to do that something. Nevertheless, you do it because of what you think of that person. Is that right? What that person said is not important, but what that person is, is important. Worship is not because of what we have received from God, but worship is because of who God is. You now, I'm just taking you through some corrections. Not only in the case of Abraham, we have such cases in the New Testament also. As we come to the 13th chapter of the book of Acts, you know the story. There was a church in a city called Antioch. They were all ministering unto the Lord. Now in the modern terms, if you want to put it, they were all worshipping the Lord, 
It was not fasting prayer, it was fasting worship. They were all fasting and ministering unto God. That's what the scripture record says. And as they were ministering unto the Lord, or as they were worshipping the Lord, the Holy Spirit told them, Separate unto me Barnabas and Paul for the ministry that I have called them unto. You know, if they had God had asked them to send anybody else, they would have sent. But Barnabas and Paul, a graceful Barnabas, and a gifted Paul, shall I tell you something, were like two eyes to the church in Antioch. Both of them were so dear and near to the life of the church, as you will later on find how they were behaving in the development of God's missionary plan for the globe. They were worshipping the Lord and God commanded them to do something. Now the other side of worship. No questions asked. No consultation held. There was only obedience. The Bible says they fasted and prayed, laid their hands and released. You might not know how difficult it is, but I'll tell you how difficult it is. God gave me the grace to lead a mission for over three decades. And sometimes there was need and God guided us to release some candidates to a very difficult place. And that person will be so gifted and talented and we would only love to keep you here where we were, but we had to do it. That's costly obedience because that's the way God does things. It's very difficult. So there in Abraham, we see individual obedience. And here in the Antiochians, we see corporate obedience. And both were the other side of worship. Are you able to connect properly? Abraham became the father of all Christians and Antiochians were the first to be called Christians. Because obedience honors God, God honors those who obey Him. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Worship is not to make me excited or impress God. Worship is to exalt God. The priority is to please God at any cost. <laughs> but here is where that first king of Israel failed. But I hear some bleedings of the sheep. No, no. We destroyed every one of them. But the people have spared some sheep and oxen for what? To sacrifice unto God. Uh, worship. And immediately Prophet Samuel said, to obey is better than sacrifice. The other side of worship. <coughs> Without obedience, our songs and shouts will become superficial. The third aspect of the other side of worship is loving relationships. Loving relationships. He was a lawyer, young lawyer, the Bible says in one record. He must have gone through lots of law books. And obviously he was confused about the hundreds of laws given by Moses in the Old Testament. He was obviously a student of the Old Testament scripture. So now as an intelligent advocate, he wanted to find out, okay, one, two, three, four, so many hundred of all of them, which is the greatest. That was the question that was bothering him. And he placed it before the master teacher. Master. And he said, good master. Which is the greatest of all commandments? Jesus said, love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and spirit. That's worship. And then he said, the second, he never asked for the second commandment. He asked for the greatest commandment. But Jesus didn't stop there. Jesus didn't stop with worship. That's the message. And, you know, the and is what is very important in Christian life. That conjunction is very important. And, the second commandment 
is equal to the first commandment. Friends, because it is second commandment, it is not secondary commandment. You have to be very careful. That's why Jesus said, the second is like the first commandment. Because anyway, in the order of mention, two cannot be said in the first instance. So it was the order of mention. <clears throat> it was not the order of importance. So the second is equal to it. Love your neighbor as yourself. And he didn't stop there. He went further on. On these two commandments. And all the law and the prophets. They are like fulcrums. The entire thing. They hang on these two things. In other words, these are the two sides of the same coin. Friends, worship is not the substitute for relationships. Turn with me to the book of Ephesians, 4th chapter. This is a passage which is, uh, this is a favorite for me because I just love it, the way the apostle has put it. 4th chapter, verse 31, he says, Ephesians 4, 31, Let all bitterness, wrath, and anger, and clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice, and be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, just as God in Christ also forgive you. And then he says in verse chapter 5, be followers of God as dear children and walk in love as Christ also loved us and given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling aroma. That's worship. There was a judge. A widow came to the judge seeking his favor to do justice unto her. But this man just turned a deaf ear to all her cries. But she kept on bothering him. But you know what this man then said? She knows that I neither revere God nor respect man. Nevertheless, that lady is coming to me. You know, usually, people who do not respect men do not properly revere God. It's impossible. If you think that you revere God and worship God, but you do not respect mankind, I tell you, you are a misnomer. You are a contradiction. Because my Bible says, how can we love God whom we have not seen if we don't love men whom we have seen? He who says he walks in the light and he loves God, but he hates his brother, he is still in darkness, he is walking in darkness, he does not know where he is going. He is totally duped, he is totally deceived. That's a deception. It's a web of deception. That is why Apostle James so vehemently came on the recipients of this letter. Brothers, you bless God on Sunday and on Monday you curse man who is created in the image of God. How come? And he gives an example. How can sweet water and bitter water proceed from the same spring? We can't bless God with a mouth and with the same mouth we cannot blaspheme our brothers and sisters. We can't backbite. The greatest problem in the church today is the defective interpersonal relationships. We call our fellowships and many times in our fellowships there is no fellowship. I thought that problem is only in India but you have, you have uh, exported it to Gulf House. <laughs> we have the cross of Jesus Christ teaching us the total message of reconciliation. The vertical stops speaking about man's reconciliation with God and the horizontal one speaks about man's relationship with his fellow men. The cross is not complete without these two. That's the message of Christmas. Glory to God in the highest. Full stop? No. Goodwill towards men. 
We are experts in vertical relationships, but we are miserable. We fail in the horizontal. You know why? We major on minors and we fail in the major. I'm just trying to put the same truth in various uh, words and uh, uh, expressions so you understand. I want to be very practical. That is why Jesus Christ said, when you come to the altar, what for you come to the altar? To offer your offerings unto God, to worship God. When you come to the altar, and then you suddenly remember that your brother has got something against you, don't offer the gift, leave the gift. Don't offer the gift. Just leave the gift there. Just lay it aside. First go and get reconciled, then come and offer the gift. The other side of worship. Am I clear? One more hour of worship is easier than one more mile of walk to help someone. Am I right? <laughs> one more hour of worship is easier than one more mile of walk to help someone. For such worship is void of all fragments. What's the other side of worship? Number four. Extravagant offering. I have deliberately chosen these words this afternoon. Extravagant offering. I don't even want to use the word liberal. I want to use the word extravagant, lavish offering. Worship that costs us nothing is worth nothing. There was a woman. Her name was Hannah. She came to the temple. She offered bowls unto God. Then she offered her boy baby also to God. Offering a bull and getting back home is easy. But offering your boy, baby boy, is difficult. And then the Bible says, they worshipped the Lord there. I like that word. They offered a bull and she gave away her son. And they worship the Lord there. I always am of the opinion, if I'm extremist, I'm very sorry for it. If you have two children, you have one too many to give to God's work. If you have two children, you have one too many to give to God. God had only one son. And he gave him as a missionary martyr for this world. What's the plan for the future of your children? What's that you're imagining? There are imaginations going on, even now. A lot of preparations are going on for the future of your son. Tell me honestly, my Bible says in the book of Exodus 13th chapter, please do turn with me to that passage. Exodus 13th chapter. I will read to you the first two verses. These are the words of God. Then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Sanctify to me all the firstborn. That word sanctify means set apart for me all the firstborn. Whatever opens the womb among the children of Israel, both of man and of animal, it is mine. I plead with you, dear brothers and sisters, when God gives you a son or a daughter, the very first time you decide before God, Lord, I want to give this child, not after he fails with three attempts in the school final, no, not then. Let him go for ministry. What else? But at the very first instance, because it's a Bible. All that comes from the womb, the first thing that comes from the womb, that is holy unto the Lord. And God doesn't say, you give that to me. God says, it is mine. We need to get back to biblical religion, back to the Bible, back to the biblical standards. We are two boys to our parents. I'm the eldest and my, we have, I have a younger brother. And my parents gave me for the ministry. 
I was first, 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 first in everything, whichever exam, whichever course, whichever interview. I was a gold medalist. Everything. I was the best. You put me anywhere, I was the best, by the grace of God, and they want to give the best for God's work. Any regrets? No. I stand before you, not as a theoretician, but I stand before you with a testimony. Give your first and the best to God. Because he is king. He is Lord. Other side of worship. Other side of worship. There's another example. She was a sinner woman. She came and wept before Jesus. That we will do. She wiped the feet of Jesus with her tears and hair. That also we would do. But she went one step further in her worship. She had a very precious ointment. Very precious ointment. Costlier than perhaps the costliest French perfume that you would have seen. She took it. She didn't body spray it on Jesus. <laughs> no, no, no. That's modern. What did she do? You want to remember that? What did she do? She poured it. She poured it. Now once you pour it, you can never collect it back. That's what it means. Pour it. She poured it. Because that was Jesus. That's King. Other side of worship. That's why I said not liberal giving, mind you, but extravagant giving. For want of any better word, I stop there. I wish a dictionary Johnson is here to give me another word. Extravagant giving. We won't mind singing a few more choruses, but we will murmur if we are asked to give more than the tithe. I'm not joking, I'm only joking. Friends, the root word for worship is worship. Do you know that? That word worship is actually an Anglo-Saxon word. And the root word for worship is worship. He is worthy. That is why that millionaire cricketer from England, C.T. Sturt, Charles Sturt said, if Christ had died for me, no sacrifice that I do for him can be too great. Amen? <coughs> Growing from tithe to total, he is climbing the ladder of worship. The fifth aspect of the other side of worship is charitable deeds. Charitable deeds. The Christian world has separated spiritual worship from social work. But that is wrong. Turn with me to the book of Isaiah chapter 1. Isaiah chapter 1. I will read from verses 13 to 17. It will be necessary for you to read through these references again. Bring no more futile sacrifices. Incense is an abomination to me. The new moons, the Sabbaths, and the calling of assembly. Oh, I cannot endure iniquity and the sacred meetings, special meetings. These things my soul hates. They are only troubling me. They are only a botheration for me. I am very tired of bearing them. When you make many prayers and lift up your hands also, I will hide my face from you. The reason your hands are full of blood. What is the meaning of your hands full of blood? He says in verses 16 and 17. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Reprove the oppressor. Defend the fatherless. And plead for the widow. So the main sin that he talked about here was social sins. Sins of omission. The Christian church has got it slightly wrong here. We preach so much against sins of commission and make very little reference to sins of omission. 
do you know on the final day we will be judged for our sins of omission than our sins of commission I was hungry, you did not feed me. I was thirsty, you did not give me the ring. I was clothless, you did not clothe me. I was a stranger, you did not accommodate me. I was a prisoner, you did not visit me. I was sick, you did not come to see me. All that, not, 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 not. So go to the left. Who said it? That the, the king will separate the goat and the sheep. And today, the subjects of worship, when we lift up our praise to God, is you are king. Someone whom you are calling king and exalting as king will tomorrow separate people to the leftist and the rightist. And those who are on the left going to eternal perishing and unquenchable fire are there because of their sins of omission. The other side of worship. You can have a lot of activities in the meeting places, but meeting places activities must reflect as acts of charity in marketplaces. If we over occupy with one and leave the other, we will be displacing God, turn with him in the book of Hebrews, which has put it so bluntly. <coughs> Hebrews 13th chapter. I read to you verses 15 and 16. So very crystal clearly the apostles have warned us. Hebrews 13, 15 and 16. Therefore, by him let us continuously offer the sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. That's wonderful. Continuous praise, non-stop praise. That's very good. <laughs> but you should not stop with verse 15, you should come to verse 16. But, underline that word but, I have encircled that word but there. That but, is, that's why I said conjunctions are important in the Bible. But, do not forget when you are over occupied with praise and worship and thanksgiving and shouts everything, but, Ah, will you all please read with me? But do not forget to do good and to share for with such sacrifices God is So it's possible that you know when we are over occupied with praise and worship, the verbal praise and worship we may forget those who are in need of what we could share with them from our material goods. That is the greatness of the early church. If you read the closing verse of the second chapter of Acts of the Apostles, you know what we read? They were praising God and having favor with all the people. You know, both always went together. They were praising God and having favor with all the people. And the very next verse has got a dramatic portrait. You know what it says? They broke bread from house to house. That we will do. Bread breaking, communion, which is Lord blessing, we say. They brought bread from house to house and they distributed bread to those who were in need. Bread breaking is meaningful without bread distribution to those who are without bread. They did it there. And that was the reason why the church was experiencing an exponential growth. Mother Teresa, it is said that she would spend hours on her knees in that frail body with keeping her hands like this in worshipping of God. And that was not the end of her life. She would get up from worship and go to the streets of Calcutta to give a quality life to those who were thrown into garbage and dustbins. Someone asked me a question. Brother, I have a very important question. Okay, what is that question? Will Mother Teresa go to heaven? And God gave me some wisdom to answer that question. There was an open forum. So I immediately answered, Will you go to heaven? If you go to heaven, if, not when, if you go to heaven, you check it out. 
It was Dr. Stanley Jones, that great Christian philosopher who came as a missionary to India, who greatly affected the thinking pattern of Mahatma Gandhi. This is what he said. A spiritual gospel without a social dimension is a ghost. And the social gospel without a spiritual message is a cause. Both are dangerous. Have a balance. Have a balance. The sixth aspect of the other side of worship is exemplary lifestyle. Exemplary lifestyle. Words to God must have the other side of what's before man. That is why Jesus said, I would begin that verse and I would expect you to complete that verse. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and are you able to see the other side of worship? Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works, not hear your great words. See, Christianity that cannot be seen, which only can be heard, is another religion. It's not the real gospel, it's another gospel. On the day of Pentecost, 3,000 people were converted because they saw and they heard. Christianity must be heard as well as seen. It's very important. That is why when Paul wrote to the Corinthian believers, he said, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. Worship the other side. Even eating and drinking not excluded. If eating and drinking not excluded means nothing is excluded. That is why I always teach for a Christian, there are no two sections like sacred and secular. For a Christian, there is nothing called secular. Everything is sacred. <laughs> now this mental correction is necessary. Lifestyle worship is more important than lip worship. Because I believe the lifestyle worship is the root for the branch which is the lip worship. If the root is holy, the branches will be holy as well. So take care of the root, then there will be fruit. It is not enough if we simply worship God. The Bible says in Colossians 3.16, we all know that, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, everything is fine. But if you go further on, you know what it reads. The entire chapter and the very next chapter speak about spouses, parents, children, master servants. You take it to the work spot. Don't stop with the worship place. Somebody said, the church is the most unattractive group on the face of the earth. Once again, excuse me for quoting Mother Teresa. She attended a big campaign where President Clinton and several other former presidents were seated up. And that day the debate was on abortion, legalizing abortion. People gave their own opinions. Then this woman also with the help of a few volunteers, she stood up and she spoke just one sentence. A nation that has legalized abortion has lost its moral conscience. And there was such a standing ovation for this frail lady's command. And for a while, President Clinton just hung his head in shame. Then he got up to say, because people wanted to know what he's going to respond, how he was going to respond to this mother's statement, because it was a very, very difficult statement she made. And you know what he said? It is very difficult 
to speak against a life which is so well lived. It is difficult to speak against a life which is so well lived and he ended it. That is why Mahatma Gandhi, the father of Indian nation, when asked a question, you are carrying a New Testament wherever you go, and you are so fond of the Sermon on the Mount of the Lord Jesus Christ, why should you not consider becoming a Christian? To which he answered, I will, be, I will consider becoming a Christian when I meet one. Maybe it is an overstatement, but we Christians must take it as a challenge. Seventhly and lastly, the other side of worship, unjust suffering, unjust suffering, accepting injustice and ill treatment patiently, that is the other side of worship. Turn with me to 1 Peter 4th chapter, I read verses 14 to 16. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, blessed are you for the spirit of glory <clears throat> and of God rests upon you. On their part he is blasphemed, but on your part he is glorified. Worship. Verse 16, if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this matter. Glorifying God. God. The Roman soldiers thought while they were whipping and executing crucifixion, they thought they were murdering the Lord Jesus Christ. But Jesus was actually offering himself as a sweet smelling offering unto God. Nobody killed Jesus. Jesus died. It's not a different, right? <laughs> Nobody killed Jesus. Jesus died. He offered himself as a sweet smelling sacrifice unto God. And there was Stephen following the footsteps of his master. They were pelting stones at him. I often used to wonder, where were the angels? The Bible says, the angel of the Lord encamps round about all those who fear him. Where did all these angels go? Everybody went on for long. Every stone enters Stephen. No stone missed the mark. He was bleeding to death. But angelic face, open heaven, vision of God's glory, Jesus standing at the Father's right hand, forgiveness, surrender. You want any better picture for worship? This is worship. Thousands and thousands of people standing in rows in heaven on the portals and courtyards. Someone asked, who are these people? I think there are some Tamilians, so there is a beautiful Tamil song which says, Allah come yaar ever heard. Who are these people? You know what the answer was? We'll read that words and close this meditation. Revelation 7th chapter, 8th words to 15th words. I'll read verses 13 and 15. Then one of the elders answered saying to me, Who are these arrayed in white robes and where did they come from? And I said to him, Sir, you know. And he said to me, These are the ones who come out of the great tribulation. And they washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. So in their hands are palm leaves. And they sing, salvation belongs to our God. And they worship the Lord God forever and ever. My dear brothers and sisters, this afternoon, the word of the Lord came to us. Turning our attention to see the other side of worship which is surrender of our bodies, unquestioning obedience, loving relationships, extravagant offering, charitable deeds, exemplary lifestyle, and unjust 
suffering. When you stand up, if you would like to embrace this other side of worship. Eyes closed. Heads bowed down. Hearts lifted up unto God. Bring before your mind all that I have just taught you during the last one hour. God is restoring all things for his people. He is committed to it. But are we guilty of choosing only that which is convenient and that which is easy? Leaving out the weightier matters. If we leave out the weightier matters and choose only that which is convenient, it's a religion of convenience and not a religion of conviction and we will be modern Pharisees. <coughs> I'm sure as we were meditating this message, the Lord convicted you at various steps and stages of where you were falling short of God's expectations. This message is not to condemn you, but it's only to convict you and to challenge you and to correct you and build you up in the most holy faith. Join me in prayer if you would like to make a commitment in these seven areas to embrace the other side of worship. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you this afternoon for...